Good evening, welcome. My name is Liz Kruger. I'm a state senator from the east side of Manhattan. And I'm so glad to have so many of you joining us tonight, both by Facebook and by phone. We're also recording this event so that people will be able to watch it later. Um, you might be hearing in the background because it's seven o'clock. Um, New Yorkers taking to their streets and the windows and um, clattering with pots and pans as we've been doing every evening at seven o'clock in respect for and appreciation for our essential workers, our healthcare workers, our frontline workers, which frankly right now includes people who bring us food as we are trapped in our homes. Um, I'm glad all of you have been able to join us and are able to stay safe. Uh, to remain safe when you go outside, remember the governor has issued an executive order to wear a mask. I'm not seeing that all the time when I go outside. So I'm urging everyone listening tonight and watching us tonight, please wear a mask. It protects you, it protects others. And also follow the rules about the six foot rule. We need to have social distancing in order to make sure that we are decreasing the rate at which this pandemic is spreading. I also just want to throw in that absentee ballots are a great way to make sure you can vote in the June primary without having to worry about being within six feet of another voter. So you can get your absentee ballot from the Board of Elections for the June 23rd primary, and you can print out the application from the Board Election website, or you can call them at 1-866-868-3692. Again, for New York City, 866-868-3692, um, if you can't go online and apply for the absentee ballot that way. Finally, a member of my team reports that the call is being picked up on the second ring and the process is very easy. And she was aware that her application, she was told her application would be sent right away. So I wanna remind everyone again, there's probably nothing more important besides staying safe than voting. In addition, we need to make sure we fill out our census forms online or in print the ballot that they mail to you. If it's not been done, you need to do it right away. The census information is used to figure out whether New York share of federal funds is going to go up or down. And at the rate we're going right now, we won't see enough money from the federal government even after we get past this pandemic. We really need the money. So I'm urging everyone to please fill out their census forms. All of it is confidential. It doesn't matter what your legal status is. It's all about do you live here? So with that, with all my introductory notes, I want to again welcome you to tonight's event with Dr. D Dennis Nash, who is an extraordinary expert in exactly the topic we all need more information about, how to keep ourselves safe and what we should be doing and not doing when living in a city of New York with COVID-19 pretty much all around us. This is going to be part one of a two-part series, which we believe will help answer many of your questions. We've asked people to put in their questions in advance. We have probably more than we can get to, but we also wanna make sure that people on Facebook can type in um, questions and hopefully we're gonna be able to get to many of them as well. Again, I'm really honored to have the distinguished epidemiologist, Dr. Dennis Nash, who's the executive director of CUNY School for Implementation Science in Population Health. I wonder if that fits on a card even. He probably needs a really big card for that long name. Um, Dennis is here with us and he is going to be presenting on his research, Chasing COVID, investigating the impact of social distancing, asymptomatic transmission, and antibody testing. Um, and then next Thursday, April 30th at 7 p.m., I'll be hosting part two, which will focus on you and your family's health with a, a medical doctor, Dr. Michael Niederman, professor of clinical medicine at Wild Cornell Medicine. So 
after you finish tonight's event and you feel like you've gotten quite a few of your broader big picture questions answered, know that if you want to come back next Thursday evening, uh, we will have a part two with a very different presentation on similar topic. Um, after Dr. Nash finishes his presentation, I'll be moderating the Q&A. And so again, those of you watching the video portion of the event on Facebook can type questions into Dr. Nash um, in the commenting below. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Nash, who's going to be presenting probably about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we will start the question and answers. So thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Nash. Thank you so much, Senator Kruger. I'm uh, loading up my slides now. Um, hopefully you all see them. Yes, we do. Yeah, good. All right, thank you, Senator Kruger, for inviting me to speak to you and your constituency tonight. Um, and hello to everyone um, on Facebook and on the phone um, from Brooklyn. I'm happy to have the opportunity to, to talk with you and share some of our work uh, that we're doing at the CUNY Institute for Implementation Science and Population Health um, uh, that we're aiming to, to conduct to improve our understanding about uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, about the pandemic here in New York, um, and about um, getting prepared for future pandemics as well. Um, I'm, I'm just going to uh, start by talking a little bit about what, what the situation is here in New York City. Um, I know you've all been hearing a lot about it. These are latest data from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, they are, are telling us that um, there have been uh, 140 some thousand people with confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection and about 30, 37,000 people who have been hospitalized and um, just over 15,000 deaths if you combine those that are confirmed to have had uh, COVID, SARS-CoV-2 infection as well as um, those deaths that uh, maybe have not been tested yet or may maybe won't even get a laboratory test but clinically look as if they died from uh, COVID. And so those are some um, very, um, very sobering and very large numbers. Um, and in fact, many of you probably also appreciate that this is really just the tip of the iceberg. We're talking about people who are diagnosed um, and who became ill, um, but there's a much larger group of people who um, are not with SARS-CoV-2 infection that are not represented on this slide. Um, it's important to keep track of some of the trends that are happening in New York City. I find it a little bit um, not, not always as useful to track trends in the number of diagnoses. So I, I, um, you can do that and you can find that on the city's health, city health department's website. Um, but one of the, th the, th the outcomes that I tend to track more closely are the trends in the hospitalizations and the trends in the deaths. And so you can see here, um, th these trends are, are uh, beginning to look more encouraging than they, they have in the past. It would appear that we've crossed the, the peak of um, hospitalizations as well as deaths, and um, these are on the decline. I will point out that on these latter days, there, there is a lag in the information that the health department gets. And so some of these numbers that look very low to, on the right side of these graphs are actually underestimates or because of incomplete reporting. And in the few days when, when the information comes in, those numbers will, will go up. But it does appear that the trend is, is going in the right direction. And I also want to highlight um, some, some of the data on, on the number of deaths by age in New York City. Uh, certainly, there's a large number of people who are in the age group of 65 and over um, who have died from COVID in New York City. But uh, also to highlight here, um, this is also something that's affecting people in younger age groups as well. Um, and just today, these are slides that, that um, Governor Cuomo presented at his press conference. Um, he released the results of a new survey that was conducted um, at grocery stores around uh, 40 locations across New York State, including New York City, um, where they actually uh, took specimens from individuals and tested them for antibodies for SARS-CoV-2 infection. And this is um, a measure of infection that that tells you whether or not you, you, you've had SARS-CoV-2 infection sometime in the past. 
And um, what they reported were, were some very, um, uh, very high numbers in terms of the percent of people estimated to be positive. And focusing here for our talk on New York City, what they found is that 21% of the people that were tested as part of this study of about 3,000 people um, around New York State, of those in New York City, about 21% had evidence of having been infected with SARS-CoV-2 um, sometime in the past. So, um, so it, it's affecting a large proportion of people in um, New York City, which is, um, I think, borne out by some of the data that we've seen on hospitalizations and deaths. Um, and then another sort of um, more shocking um, statistic is here showing the, the disparity um, the racial and ethnic differences in SARS-CoV-2 infection um, with, with uh, upwards of 22% among persons of color um, compared with a much lower percent, um, sometimes may, maybe more than half, half 50% lower among whites. So the, the um, response to the public health crisis, these are just you know, one of several metrics that um, can be tracked to sort of see what's going on and assess the effectiveness of the public health response. And I think the encouraging trends that we are seeing in terms of declines in hospitalizations and deaths are due to the physical distancing, the stay at home um, orders and, and some of these things that I, you know, I'll call non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, and I just want to start by orienting us a little bit to what I think some of the key goals of the public health response to the pandemic are. Um, there are many goals, but these are ones that are, I'm, I, I think are especially important. The first is to mitigate, suppress, and control transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in the community. And this is why we're doing things like social and physical distancing and other non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, the second goal is to prevent and minimize morbidity and mortality from COVID-19 disease. And this is why we need to capacitate our hospitals and make sure they have enough ventilators and, um, and things like that and enough hospital beds. Um, and goal number three is about protecting the healthcare workforce and other essential workers from becoming infected with SARS-CoV-2. As, as um, Senator Kruger alluded to, um, these, are, these are the heroes that are really holding New York City together right now. Um, there are some key epidemiologic questions that um, still are as yet unanswered that are, are critical to informing the public health response. And the first is what is the impact of these interventions on the incidence of infection, disease, and deaths? I think we're beginning to see what that looks like in New York City. Um, and also um, something to come down the pike is what is the impact of relaxing some of these measures on, on those outcomes? as we begin to reopen, um, re reopen the economy and things like that. Um, and among those with SARS-CoV-2 infection, what proportion are asymptomatic? Like we still don't have a great handle on that. Um, and finally, among those who have recovered from, from infection, is there protection against reinfection or development of severe disease after that? Um, and is it short -term? does it exist, first of all? And if it does exist, is it short-term or long-term? So um, I wanted to just uh, take a few minutes to tell you what we're doing at the CUNY Institute for Implementation Science and Population Health uh, to, to address some of these research questions. We launched a study called the Chasing COVID Research Study um, on March 28th uh, to begin enrolling people um, and following them over time to answer some of these questions. Um, in fact, uh, at that time, there were about 122,000 cases and, and about 2,000 deaths that have been documented in, in the United States um, when we launched this study. Um, people could come to join the, uh, the study at, on our website, and we also advertised on social media um, to tell people about the study, and they could click through some of these ads to, to join. And we used um, social media to do that. And uh, three weeks later, as of, um, as of April 20th, we closed our, our study. Uh, having enrolled about 7,300 people, representing individuals from every U.S. state, uh, Puerto Rico and Guam. You can see the, the geographic distribution of, of the cohort here, and we'll be following them forward in time. Um, this, is, this, this cohort that we've recruited um, over, overlaps very well with what the distribution of new diagnoses of SARS-CoV-2 looks like 
in, in the US. So our, the map of our cohort, the uh, Chasing COVID cohort is on the left there with the yellow dots and the map from the New York Times uh, website showing the distribution of, of cases and, and the, these overlap well. So we've enrolled a cohort that is, um, that, that is in, in the places where active transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is occurring. Um, just to tell you a little bit about what the cohort looks like, these are data from um, a, a few a, a few days ago before we finished our enrollment. But um, the the median age is about 38. We've gotten about six percent of our cohort are people above the age of 65. Um, about 22 percent are persons of color, and a fair proportion of them have comorbidities that that put them at risk for. Uh, bad outcomes should they become infected with SARS-CoV-2. And I should, I should be clear, these are not people that have SARS-CoV-2 infection. These are people um, in the general population who decided to enroll in our study. Some of them will have had the infection, some of them will, will have not. Um, in fact, we asked them if they've had um, any COVID-like symptoms. Um, and, and we could see that some of them even sought to see a physician for these symptoms or a, a smaller number were hospitalized for them and a small, and a small number tested as well. Um, in our cohort, we have healthcare workers and, and other essential workers that have been recruited. And we also ask them questions about things that um, are happening, that, that they're doing um, to reduce their risk of acquiring an infection and also to reduce the risk of transmission in the community. So avoiding large gatherings, um, increasing telecommuting, wearing a face mask, and also as Senator Kruger alluded, um, this is not certainly not a universal uh, thing that was happening, um, and increased hand washing. Um, so we're asking them um, at the baseline visit, these are the questions, th these are the sort of realms of things that we've asked them about to give you a sense of the um, the, the breadth of the study and the comprehensiveness of, of um, data that we're collecting. Um, and on the right here, I'm showing you some of the things that we'll be asking people over time as we follow them up. Um, we're about to launch the one month interview. Um, we're gonna be asking some of the same questions about what are they doing with regard to uh, social and physical distancing and other non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, but we'll also be, um, with, with some luck on uh, funding, we'll be offering serologic testing to understand the, the presence of antibodies. And I'll talk about that in just a second. We'll continue collecting information on healthcare access and insurance status, uh, food security, um, their anxiety and risk perceptions, depression, um, interpersonal violence, as well as a, a number of, of other things. So these are the kinds of things that we'll be um, gathering on our the, the members of our cohort. Um, this is some this is a study that our institute and our, the School of Public Health, the CUNY uh, Graduate School of Public Health, where we're housed, um, has, has sponsored the launch of this cohort. But to do the the, uh, the antibody testing that we would like to do is actually something that is very expensive, um, and we needed to we, we have applied to to the National Institutes of Health for a grant to do that. And if we were able to get, if, if we do get that funding, we will be mailing out um, specimen collection kits to our, well, actually we are mailing out the specimen collection kits um, this week and next week to our participants where they will use a, a small lancet that's in, contained in the, in the kit to, to prick their finger and, and leave some dried blood spots on a, on a card that they will then put back in the mail and, and send to our lab so that we can we can do the testing. We will be saving those dried blood spots at the lab um, until we can um, get the funding to do the test, as well as until we can be sure that we have a, a good and reliable uh, antibody test, which as many of you may have heard, that there's a lot of um, very rapid movement in the field around antibody testing. We did test out this process in our cohort though um, with a few of our participants and um, it worked smoothly. The whole process worked well through the mail. So what are we uh, trying to learn in this NIH proposal? Um, should we get the funding, we will be able to do things like um, you know, rapidly estimate the incidence of the infection and evaluate the impact of different non-pharmaceutical interventions on the incidence of infection, disease, and death. And we will also, be, because this will be a study that goes on for some time, maybe six months, maybe um, maybe even 18 months, um, we'll be able to look at 
how things progress when different areas of the country change what they're doing um, around relaxing non-pharmaceutical interventions and 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 um, and going you know going back to work and opening the um, uh, the opening society and the economy again. Um, we will also be able to estimate um, provide an estimate of the proportion of people that have SARS-CoV-2 infection who were asymptomatic or had only mild symptoms. As I mentioned, this is an important piece of epidemiologic information that um, we're still trying to pin down. Um, and finally, we will, want, we will be able to rapidly assess whether or not having antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 infection are, are protective against subsequent disease. When we first do the first wave of testing, we will identify people who are positive and people who are negative. And we'll continue to follow them forward in time and we'll be able to compare the rates with which um, people with antibodies develop disease to those without antibodies and be able to say something about uh, the short-term immunity um, or protective effects if, if they are there. Um, so I'll just uh, conclude by saying there's a lot uh, remaining to be learned that can inform the response to the current pandemic as well as future pandemics. So what we're focusing on is just one small part um, that is related to the public health response. Um, and I'll just end here. I want to acknowledge the many people uh, at CUNY that have been um, working very hard to, to launch this study very quickly in the middle of a pandemic um, so that we can hopefully get some of the epidemic intelligence that we, we want to, to get quickly um, and share it with the rest of the world. Thanks very much. I'm happy to take some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dennis. That's a lot to absorb and really this understanding that you're, you, like most in the people in science, are at the beginning of the challenging homework to understand more what this disease is, what the patterns are, um, but you sound like your study will provide us it, to have that information we need later about what's the long-term impacts, what is happening to people um, beyond the immediate crisis we're having now. And that is, I know, crucial for planning um, how we ought to be preparing. So many of our questions I think maybe it's fairly simple for you, but it's really important to understand how confusing the messaging getting out there is and how confused people still are. So questions. Is it safe to eat raw fruit and vegetables? Do I need to wash them in special ways? Should I only be cooking food before I eat it? Because am I risking um, transmitting the disease to myself and my family through raw food? foods? Well, I think we do know that um, washing hands with soap and water um, does kill the virus. And so I think the, the same is true with, with uh, raw vegetables, uh, fruits. And, and so washing them is, is a good thing, um, even in the absence of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, for foodborne diseases. Um, I, I think um, another strategy is um, if, if stuff can sit for a little while before you, you consume it, um, you know, there's more time for anything that is contaminated to, to die. So, um, you know, if, if, if you buy a, a, a half a dozen apples, maybe they can sit for a few days before you wash them and eat them. Okay. So there's lots of information in the news about various drugs that people promise can be helpful, but everyone's still waiting for real research on whether or not those drugs are valuable. But do we know if there are any drugs you should stay away from if you think you have COVID that could actually make it worse? Um, they, there, was, there were some reports of people using ibuprofen um, as being potentially problematic if you had um, COVID disease, but I think these were um, not really substantiated and I don't think there's any Thing that you should avoid. Um, there, there's, there's, no, there are no treatments though that are available, and some some of the treatments that uh, people are recommending without any evidence are, are certainly things that should be avoided. You should always consult with your doctor about um, whether or not you should be taking in any medicines uh, for for treating COVID. They they don't exist yet. Okay. Senator Kruger, um, excuse me. Hello. 
Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I don't know the difference between us. Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, we're, not stars. Taking, we're not taking live questions, so if you'd please mute. I'm sorry. Um, you can write in a question, but please, no one who is listening in can go off of mute. I apologize. Um, Dr. Nash, going back, um, probably the most relevant question people keep asking about is the, their concern about masks. We know that there's been a shortage of the kinds of masks medical personnel need, and now we have people believing that they need perhaps medical quality masks to go out and walk around communities, or whether is it okay to just use personal, um, you know, made masks in your home. The Surgeon General had a YouTube about taking two rubber bands and like a dinner napkin and turning it into a mask. There's lots of different uh, people who are selling homemade cotton masks. Um, I'm just curious, can we just use cotton fabric with rubber bands for masks, for coming and going in our normal lives if we're not actually working in a healthcare setting? Well, um, as you noted at the beginning, we were actually required to, to do that. Um, and and so um, I, I also think that it certainly can't hurt for a number of ways, but the rationale behind it is that if people wear masks, um, even cloth masks that are homemade, they can reduce the amount of droplets that leave the mouth that could potentially be left somewhere um, or land on someone else that, that could transmit the infection. And um, I, even, even a non-medical mask could potentially be effective or better than none at doing that. Um, and I guess the other uh, thing that wearing masks does is it kind of helps, helps, uh, helps us remember the, the different uh, situation we're in right now. Our, our natural tendency is to, um, you know, want want to interact with people and talk to them and get get close with them. And and having that the the mask on, I think, serves as a a prompt, a reminder that that this is not um, business as usual. I thought also, um, uh, Senator Kruger, I, I I realized maybe I should clear up some some of the terminology that um, I've been using. Um, I, I, I refer to things like SARS-CoV-2 and COVID, um, and then everyone has heard coronavirus. And I, I just want to be clear what I mean when I say SARS-CoV-2, I'm referring to the virus. And when I say COVID-19, I'm referring to the disease that the virus causes. Uh, so so SARS-CoV-2 and coronavirus are the same thing, but there are many coronaviruses, and so you will hear um, technical people talk about SARS-CoV-2 to be specific. So I have a lot of questions here that are variations from people about that they have literally locked themselves up so tightly in their homes for multiple weeks and their concern, is it like safe to go out at all? Is it okay to go pick up your prescriptions at your drugstore or go out to your food store and go shopping? Um, and I guess it's sort of the balance between the important messaging we are trying to get across to everyone about stay safe by staying in place, put all the right equipment on, but also, you know, wanting to honestly answer people about, you know, can you go outside and take a walk in the sun? Can you go food shopping? I mean, my, my simple answer is, if you are doing all the things you should, when you're doing that, yes, if you're using a mask, if you're staying six feet away from people, if your stores, since now they're required to, are making sure people come in and wear masks, so their, their staff wear masks, and you can deal with the challenge in some New York City supermarkets of actually being able to stay six feet away from other people. Um, so I'm just curious what you, know, you and other um, people who are specialists are advising your own families, for example. Um, I completely agree with everything you said. I, I do think it's important for people to get outside so long as they can do it safely. Um, I, I think the other thing that I would just add um, to keep in mind there is there needs to be a lot of hand washing um, all the time, but especially when you're when when you're going in and out and and avoiding touching your your face, your your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Um, 
unless you've just washed your hands. So, so um, I would just add that that's really important. It's sometimes hard to, to remember, but it's one of the things that um, can really help reduce your own risk. I have friends with small children who say trying to get them to understand not touching their face seems almost impossible. Should they be requiring their children to wear gloves at all times? Do you actually think that is a useful practice? Um, I don't know about that, but I, I do think it's useful to have them wash their hands a lot. I mean, that, yeah. that's, I, I mean, that, that's really, I think, maybe the, the most you can do for the, the small kids. Exactly. Yes, there were so many questions relating to, you know, some people were, in writing their questions, they're actually describing perfect behavior and then saying at the end of the question, is that what I should be doing? And the answer is like, yes. Yeah. So people who say, I don't go out that much for essential errands. I remove my shoes at the door. I remove disposable gloves and masks, put in a separate garbage bag. I wash my hands after any time I come or go. I wash the doorknobs of my building in my apartment. And if I've touched anything that was outdoors, I wipe it down. Um, when I brought it in from the outside, I wash my fruits and vegetables. Um, and I make sure I stay six feet away from anywhere else. I think that's sort of, that even though she says, is there anything more I can be doing? I think the answer is no. If everybody was doing exactly what you were doing, we would see a further flattening of the curve. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think we can all always wash our hands more. So I would just add that. <laughs> Another question that I'm not sure there's a consistent answer for is, if you believe you've had COVID, um, whether or not you have the test, but then you don't have any symptoms anymore, how long should you be waiting before you feel, you know, that you can loosen up your staying away from everywhere? I mean, in some families, one person believes they've had COVID, so they sort of lock them in one room and then they're like, well, you have to be healthy again for 14 days. Other people say three days once you finish having symptoms. What's the, what is the standard norm now? Well, I think um, the recommendations are, uh, from our city health department are um, you can leave your house after being sick if, if it's been, uh, all, if all these things are true. It's been at least seven days since your symptoms started and you haven't had a fever for three days without the use of, of fever-reducing drugs, and your cough or sore throat symptoms have improved. If all three of those things have happened, then it's okay to, to leave your house and stay out and go out of isolation. Um, a question that just came in from Facebook, someone who was in Italy back in September um, believes that she, she or he did have COVID um, but didn't get tested is there a reason that they would be particularly relevant or useful for a follow-up study um, on their antibodies now? And is there somewhere to be that we should direct them? Well, I I, I think um, that that would be the the earliest that I would have heard of of um, transmission happening. Um, so it would be on the early side um, if they. If, to, to have been infected, um, it's still possible. So when you get an antibody test, um, it basically tells you whether you've ever been infected. So if that person were to get a test today um, and were found to be positive, it wouldn't necessarily mean they were infected in September when they were in Italy, they could have been infected any time since then. Um, the, the test doesn't really tell you that. Okay. And have there been documentation that there are actually different strains of um, COVID based on what part of the world it might have been brought into the U.S. from? Um, or is that just, you know, a wise tale out there, an urban myth? Well, it's possible to do some, to, to do genetic testing of the virus to, to see um, where it may have originated from. So the viruses evolve genetically. Um, and and when and and 
when transmission happens in one place, it evolves differently than when it happens in another place. And so it's possible to, to tell um, what geographic area of the world it may have originated from. And that's why we've seen some, some interesting studies um, suggesting that, in fact, uh, SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus was introduced into New York City, not, not from China, but from travelers from Europe. Um, it's th those kinds of studies that help us uh, understand that. So when you listen to the news, you hear people saying to be ready for a second wave, perhaps in the fall, and then you hear other doctors talking about the next time we have a bad flu season, which I guess is usually thought to be more in the winter, that we should expect a larger second wave of COVID. Why are people saying that? Why do, why do they feel like they know that all? I don't think we know exactly how it's going to um, evolve. I do think that most experts would say that this pandemic is gonna be with us for a while. Um, it may come in waves because when we begin to relax um, physical distancing, um, that's inevitably going to result in an increase in transmission. Um, but the, the, the point of the, the public health strategy is, is not to do that until we're ready, not to do that until our healthcare system is in a better position to be able to absorb and manage the, um, the burden that this pandemic puts on it. And, and that we should be able, to, when, if that begins to become too great, then we begin to implement physical distancing again to tamp it back down. Um, so I do think there will be waves um, I, I I don't know that we can predict how it's going to be rolling out as it, as it relates to to flu um, or what the seasonality looks like. We just don't know yet. Okay. Apparently, we're getting quite a few questions via Facebook that are more the clinical, personal, medical health questions um, that we're going to take up on next Thursday's um, part two. So. Folks who are asking those kinds of questions just know we will be collecting those as you're putting them on Facebook, but we don't think those are the questions for me to ask Dr. Nash, so you're not going to hear those questions tonight. But thank you for putting them in and we're getting lots and lots of responses and comments. I um, also want to reinforce, because you keep saying it and, and we can't reinforce it enough, wash your hands, wear masks, don't necessarily worry whether it's a cotton mask you made yourself or a medical standard mask, um, but wear those masks and keep six feet away from people um, when you are outside. I just, it's like we just can't say it enough. Um, and relating to that, based on the data you showed us from your earlier slides about the impact being so disproportionately deaths are people 65 and up, um, from those charts you had. Is there a logic to at some point saying, all right, if you're 65 or older, we're going to have you continue to pause and stay at home, but other people can continue to move more into a regular daily life? Is, is there a flaw with that thinking um, for the the assignment that we all need to make sure is, is working correctly. No, I don't think there's a flaw at all. I mean, much, much of what we're doing is, um, you know, in an effort to protect those, not just ourselves from becoming infected, but to protect others who are especially, who may be especially vulnerable um, to, you know, more severe and lethal outcomes of, of being infected. And so um, I think it's absolutely um, a strategy that we need to be thinking about um, that should be different for those who are more vulnerable compared to others. And um, I, I think, you know, the, the, the strategy is to, um, for, for folks to wait as long as possible um, in that situation in the hopes that a vaccine becomes available um, or treatments um, where that, where, whereby it wouldn't be as dangerous or lethal uh, to be infected with, with coronavirus. But right now it's pretty, it's pretty dangerous for someone who's older or someone who has a lot of comorbidities um, that put them at risk for, for worse outcomes. 
Thank you. Um, some questions about travel. Do you think we should be cutting off allowing people to travel to the United States from other countries? Or do you think we as Americans should be allowed to travel or should be told, no, just stay at home for now? Um, you know, that that's a, a, I think we've answered that question about, um, you know, the need to stay at home and people shouldn't be going anywhere unless they, they have um, essential, some, some, you know, critical essential need to go there. Um, so, I don't think people should be traveling around the, the country and the world right now unless they, they really need to. I agree, but people wrote these questions in, so we wanted to make sure we gave you a chance to give your, your two cents on them. Um, so we've been working really hard here in New York to make sure we have adequate hospitalization, available, available hospital beds, the right equipment, um, professionals for all assignments and it's, it's been tough for us but we're clearly getting better at it we're getting more hospital supplies we're seeing fewer people as you pointed out um, needing hospitalization or dying um, but there's lots and lots of concerns still about testing and then testing for um, immunities post illness if you had to pick one, which do you think is more important from a public health perspective? Making sure everybody is getting tested or making sure we are doing the follow-up post-COVID um, or post-thinking you might have had COVID um, to see whether you did and whether there are immunities that are in your blood? Um, I think this there's not one silver bullet strategy we have to think of this as like multiple strategies coming together to help help us see our way um out the other side of this pandemic um with as minimal uh loss of life and harm as as possible so um i, I find it hard to say you know which which would i choose there, there's actually a multitude of things that we need to be doing around testing and around um you know making sure that our uh, healthcare system can can respond to the demand that this pandemic is putting on them. Um, and then I think when we get to a place where things are more manageable um, and, and tests are available, we can think about um, strategies that involve more testing and, um, and, and targeted, um, more targeted activities. So it seems like we wake up in the morning and we read the newspapers and we learn something else we didn't know about this disease or or researchers found, oh, we were not, or not long-term research, obviously, but oh, we were wrong, this is a better strategy, or this strategy didn't work, this one does. Do we think now that the tests that are being given um, to determine whether we have or don't have COVID um, are actually providing accurate data? Do we think we have that test correct now? They, they're not false negatives or false positives? Oh, I think there remains to be the, the the tests that we have now leave, leave a lot to be desired. Um, the the ones there there are two broad broadly speaking two different kinds of tests: molecular tests that look for the presence of active infection in an individual, um, and then there are the the serologic tests or the antibody tests that say whether or not someone's been infected in the past. Uh, both have their limitations. Um, and, you know, my hope is that we see them improve over time, um, but they, they both have major li limitations. Um, the, the, the molecular tests have um, high rates of false negatives, and the serologic tests are um, really just all over the map, and there's, there just needs to be a lot, of, a lot more work to validate them. And it's hard to validate them because there's, um, you know, we don't have a perfect molecular test. Um, to tell if someone's actively infected. So the gold standard is is uh, missing. Got it. So we just got a question that hopefully you'll understand because it's way past me. How does COVID antibody testing differ from standard protein tests for IgG and IgM, such as an SPEP test? Okay, the COVID, um, the SARS-CoV-2 antibody tests or sero serology um, are the tests that detect IgM and IgG antibodies. 
are the same. Gosh, thank you. I was glad that you were answering that one because I was, I was lost. Um, something I had actually skipped earlier, but I'm still getting more questions about it. Um, does the virus live long on clothing? And should we be washing our clothing um, in the in our apartment washers or at a laundromat somewhere? Um, it can live on all kinds of sources, uh, surfaces, um, and and it can live um, for quite some time. What we don't know is um, how infectious something a, a virus, the virus on a surface, will be after you know one day, two days, three days. Um, you know, this is why, because we don't know this and because it can be on things like clothes, on surfaces, um, on keys and uh, phones, cell phones, um, this is why we need to wash our hands a lot uh, because it, there's there's no way we're going to avoid coming into contact with it, um, even if you are very careful. And so um, th this, is, this is why it's important to wash hands. And whether you should wash your clothes inside or outside, um, I mean, I think you just have to do wash them the way you normally would, um, but just wash your hands in the process. So some people are opposed to vaccinating themselves or their children, and that's been a public health issue in its own right. Is there some reason to believe that um, people who have not been vaccinated for other diseases either are, either are at greater risk now to be infected by COVID or are at greater risk to be transfers of COVID to others? Um, we are learning that um, people who have gotten the BCG vaccine, which is a, a vaccine um, that is used um, not in the U.S., but in other countries for for tuberculosis uh, may, may be protective. Um, so to, to serve as um, a way to protect becoming infected to begin with. Um, but other than that, we really are in very early stages um, of learning about vaccines for, for the coronavirus. And do we know anything about whether weather patterns impact COVID's um, transferability? So. Are there people who think in really hot weather there's an issue for COVID living longer or living less long, or if it's really cold, which it's never going to be again in our lives, but let's say it was, that that would be a positive or negative on the pattern of the disease? Well, we really don't know yet because we haven't been through a full year. Um, but one thing we do know is that, um, you know, there are different climates all over the world and the, the virus has shown up in all areas of the world. And so warm and cold, um, it's possible to have outbreaks of coronavirus. Um, now, what could be different is the extent to which um, the, the virus can spread in some climates and others, but we, we don't have a good handle on that. Um, and I, I think it's, um, you know, it, it's possible but we don't know, and, and I don't think we should make any decisions or have magical thinking about um, whether it's going to go away when the weather warms up. Um, I, I'm certainly not expecting to do that. Okay, thank you. I'm just looking for, I jumped through a number of them, but I'm going to just go back and revisit a moment. Oh, once we have established an easier way to have the antibody test, meaning it's more publicly available and probably the same kind of question we had on the other part of the test that there's a bunch of different antibody tests being marketed. Some people say some of them are more legitimate than others. So hopefully government will conclude, okay, this is the one or two that really work. And then we're going to assume we can get access to them. Is it going to actually tell us based on the quantity of antibodies in your blood, we think you're probably safe from getting it again. Will it be like a grading system or will it just be a, you show antibodies, you don't show antibodies and that's all we learn? Um, the, the tests are able to quantify the amount of antibodies and the types of antibodies, um, but, but we, regardless of what we may learn about that in any one person, 
we still don't know if, if even if you have a lot of antibodies, um, if it's going to be protective against um, subsequent infection or development of disease. This is one of the reasons, one of the things we're trying to get at with the chasing COVID study. We are going to see what happens um, with individuals who have antibodies yet um, remain in a, in a situation where there's active transmission of the virus. Um, do they develop disease at the same rate or at a lower rate than people who don't have antibodies? That That is the real only way that we're going to answer that question. And we know from data coming out, not just here in New York, but everywhere there's been COVID in this country, that it disproportionately is impacting um, poor communities, communities of color. Um, as a researcher, what lessons have you learned already from that reality that we're seeing? Yeah, so this is this is a very uh, stark and unfortunate outcome of of this pandemic, and also our strategies to address it. Um, it it's, um, I would say, that, however, um, this is mirroring the kinds of health disparities that we see for almost every other health condition in in the city, and in the country. Um, it plays out in slow motion for hypertension and cardiovascular disease and um, all, ki all kinds of other things every day. In this pandemic, it's playing out at, at a very high speed. And so it's really noticeable. And um, I, I think, why is it happening? So partly it's, it's just unfortunately the way, the way that some populations that are more vulnerable are disproportionately affected by health outcomes in our society. We have a lot of fundamental inequalities in wealth and socioeconomic status um, that are, are some of the major underlying fundamental determinants of health in our country. Um, with SARS-CoV-2 and the coronavirus outbreak, there are also some differences that could be contributing to the outcomes we're seeing, such as higher death rates among people of color in New York. Um, this could be because, uh, first and foremost, that people of color are more likely to become infected with the virus. Why would that be? Um, that could be because they are more likely to be essential workers or people who can't necessarily work from home or stay at home. Um, they need to be out there um, in the community at their jobs working so that they can um, bring, bring home um, an income and put food on the table. And that puts them at greater risk for becoming infected. Um, it also could be that um, people who are in um, poor neighborhoods are living in more crowded living situations. And if they do get sick, it's harder for them to isolate themselves from other people in their household. Um, and this could be another reason why. Um, and in terms of the deaths, um, it also could be that we, we know, like I alluded to, um, poor communities um, and disadvantaged communities have a higher prevalence of all kinds of other health problems than, than um, wealthier communities. And these health problems are some of the very things that put people who become infected with coronavirus at higher risk for, for hospitalization and death. And lastly, um, I'll just say that um, the, the, the quality of health care um, re is really variable. And some of the, qual the quality of health care in some of these poorer neighborhoods is um, not at the same level as the quality of healthcare in wealthier neighborhoods. And they may be more likely to be overwhelmed. Um, and, and so getting a COVID diagnosis in a poor community um, can be a more lethal prospect than one in a wealthier community. It's very unfortunate, but that's how things like this play out in our society. Exactly. Well, it has actually come to 7.55, which is when I am supposed to thank you, Dr. Nash, very much for your participation tonight. Um, the questions that we got were incredibly varied and I think all reflect what people are thinking about, what people are still concerned about for themselves. You know, we're living through an extraordinarily difficult time and the demands on our professionals in healthcare uh, are enormous. So I just want to, again, thank you for taking on this work. I think that hearing about the early parts of your study, collecting data, 
um, even before you're doing the testing of blood samples from people all over this country are go is going to be incredibly important for all of us to understand the patterns that we will continue to have to face and hopefully the lessons to be learned to be smarter and safer and other parts of the country perhaps even realizing earlier than we did all the steps we need to take to decrease the rate of transmission of disease and how to avoid having people um, dying at such high rates. I do think it's, it is, you know, something positive to look at when you look at those charts you started with showing the drop in the number of both hospitalizations and deaths. Um, I know I check those numbers every morning because it's almost like, okay, how depressed am I going to feel today? Or am I going to feel that there is an opportunity here and we're taking it and things are moving up? And I do think that the recent numbers helps us move up. But again, for the people who are listening or watch, watching on the phone, on Facebook, I want to thank you all for participating. I want to remind you that next Thursday, April 30th at 7 p.m., we're doing part two of the series with Dr. Michael Niederman, which will focus on you and your family's health. Um, and an email will be sent this week for RSVPs to everyone who signed up for this town hall if you would like to sign up for the next one or to let other people you know sign up. Again, if you get my community bulletins, we've been putting them out every day with updates about what we have learned and are helpful for people under these difficult times. So if you don't get that and you'd like to sign up, you just go to my website, lizkruger.com, and the top right, you can sign in your email, and we will make sure you get on that mailing list, or you can email my office or call my office. I have the greatest team in government, and they are working hard every single day to try to respond to um, you and everyone else who reaches out to us for help. Um, again, stay well, stay safe, wear a mask, stay six feet apart, and just keep washing those bloody hands of yours. Um, you can put hand cream on right after if you're sitting there worried that they're wearing off. Your skin will grow back. Um, so again, thank you all for participating tonight. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Nash, for joining us. Thank you, Senator, for having me. Thank you. All right.